Hey there, Gary Parrish. Welcome back to CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent. You haven't, if you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, go ahead and knock that out while you're here. Today we are continuing our conference previews for the 2022-23 college basketball season. We've already done the American, the ACC, the Big East, Big Ten, Big 12, and the Pac-12. Now we turn our attention to the SEC, where Kentucky is considered uh, the preseason favorite thanks to the return of National Player of the Year Oscar Sheebway, Xavier Wheeler, Jacob Toppin, the enrollment uh, of Casey Wallace and Chris Livingston. Deadleg, let's stop here. I know you've picked Kentucky to win the SEC, same as I. Mm-hmm. But if, if I told you you could uh, take Guster's average gait Oh and bet it on either Kentucky or the field to win the SEC, which way would you gamble with the money created from Guster's ticket sales? Ooh, good question. Also, the question is, what is what does Guster bring at its average show? What is the gate for the average Guster show? I couldn't no. speak to that. You would know better than I. You're the one that's on stage with them. That's true. Uh, I don't I, – I, I, I avoided uh, outright – either texting or going up to the guys and asking, hey, how much do you guys pull in per kick? Yeah, well, just, just um, can you, like, uh, airdrop me their contact info, and I'll send them a text here in a there, second. Uh, there actually is, uh, or at least there was at one point, uh, when I was in college and I worked at the student newspaper, the student radio station, um, you know, you'd get these packet packets where you'd have artists that would be willing to play on college campuses, and with it, there would be a figure attached to that number. So universities can determine, all right, if we want to have this artist play, how much do we have to be able to to pay them? Uh, I remember looking, uh, trying to uh, to get Guster, um, and it. I remember it being like a, a relatively decent number, but I actually looked into this thing many, many, many years ago. Uh, keep it together era of Guster. To your question. Mm. I would bet the field here because I think we have a good four team race emanating in the SEC with that in mind. My five storylines. All right. I've been waiting for these all day. I know you have. Number one is Calipari trying to shake off the fan irritation, basically, GP, and the pressure from the past two seasons and get back to the final four for the first time since 2015. That's right. That's a trivia time victory for GP. There we go. I did not say it was a trivia time. I know, but I, 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 I self-titled that okay. um, trivia time. Uh, again, that's just not how trivia time works, but... To agree to disagree. So, goes. so, yeah, longest route under Cal by far. I mean, they were making Final Force with regularity there for the first half of his tenure, and now, you know, there's just, you know, between the like top five bottom season history of the program in 2021, and then last season, a really nice season, and then you drop to St. Peter's, you know, what Kentucky looks like over the course of the season, what it does in March, I think that's the biggest storyline. Number two, I think, is actually Eric Musselman trying to make a Final Four with Arkansas, do that for the first time since the 90s with, hello, 11... 19, 19, 1995. Trivia time victory for GP. Two in a row. Uh, you're, ruining, you're ruining trivia time right now. <laughs> I'm just going to randomly say things that I know and then call it a trivia time and then declare victory. It's unfortunate. Um... He's going to try and do it with 11 new players. We will obviously get to the Hogs in just a minute here. Storyline three is obviously Oscar Sheebway's National Player of the Year push. Can he be the first person to do it since Ralph Sampson did it in the 80s? That was a back-to-back-to-back situation with Ralph. We talked about that on a re, uh, on a previous um, on a Ralph podcast. Sampson, last last player to be back-to-back uh, National Player of the Year, and he's also tall. Trivia time, mm. three in a row. Brutal, man. Storyline four is new coaches galore. SEC was by far the busiest power conference on the carousel. Florida, LSU, Missouri, South Carolina, Mississippi State, and Georgia all have new faces in new places. Uh, real quick, over or under, 1.5 NCAA tournament bids for those six schools. Over or under GP being in the NCAA tournament, those six, Florida, LSU, Missouri, South Carolina, Mississippi State, Georgia, all have new coaches. Over or under 1.5 of those teams dancing in 23. I'll go under, but I do believe that one of them will make it. In fact, I did the SEC preview because the SEC has 14 members and I get all the conferences with the most members. And mm-hmm. I, I you didn't think- get the ACC, which has 15. <laughs> Let's just think again. Tri- uh, trivia time for me, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. What we're doing here. So there we go. ACC has 15. Victory. Um, 
I, I, I wrote that I do think, like, I noted there are a lot of new coaches in the SEC. Turns out getting all this television money, boy, you can afford to buy out coaches and, and get new ones. And so that's what's happening in the SEC. Uh, I do think one of them will make it, and I think the most likely is Florida. Agree, and I will also go under 1.5. Last storyline uh, is something we've talked about a couple times here in the past 12 months on the pod. And we'll, you know, maybe, uh, you know, venture in the sandbox a little bit more when we talk about the Vols. But is Tennessee going to make a March jump? Rick Barnes has unquestionably delivered on his charge. He's brought Tennessee to a respectable place. But I, I think this does linger as a top five plot point for the season, GP. Because uh, the Vols have one second weekend tournament appearance since he got there. It was a Sweet 16 run a few years back. You know, we're talking about a Tennessee team that is a near universal pick to be preseason top 10, right? Uh, I do think Tennessee fans although they're quite thrilled with the state of their football program, and that comes first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth in Knoxville, uh, I do think they will find a new noise level if this team at minimum isn't in the picture when we get to the regional semis in 2023. So that's just another headline to consider the five biggest ones as we prepare for November and get ready for what will probably be a top ha- uh You have completely frozen on me. I'm back. I lost internet for about nine seconds. So go ahead. Oh, wow. That was the, that was the most, <laughs> that was the most intense nine seconds of my life. I don't want to hear that either, but yes, I actually literally did drop out on internet at the, at, at, when I was just done talking. So I was hoping you were going to take it, but there we go. Live podcasting folks. We love it. All right, let's just pick up like that never happened. How many sec programs going to make the 2023 NCAA tournament? We're going to discuss that next provided the internet works first though a word from our partners the uefa champions league on paramount plus nine months of heart stopping hold your breath acceleration that's brilliant with mo magic and more drama while the former barbarian nails the back of the net in barcelona an american trades his stars with zebra stripes and a norwegian creates sky blue spectacles so stream every switch so second of regulation time stoppage time and extra time beyond magnificent this is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. So the SEC got six schools in the NCAA tournament last season. Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, LSU, Alabama. Six bids. All six seeds are better. Only mm-hmm. Arkansas made the Elite Eight. None of them made the Final Four. Dead leg, I'm going to set the bar at six bids. 6.5 bids uh, for the SEC. You taking the over or the under? 6.5. Take the over. That's uh, five. Yeah, I'll take the over. Seven. I'll take seven. I know you're taking seven as well. I know it. I think I'd go seven. Jerry Palm goes seven. I, w- I wouldn't sit here live on a frozen internet and, and, and go against Jerry Palm so publicly. Jerry's got Kentucky as a one seed, Arkansas as a three, Tennessee as a three, um, Auburn as a five, Texas AM as a six, Alabama as a seven. In Florida as a as a ten seed, and I think that is the same order that I would that I would have them in. I, I've got yeah, Texas in him, Alabama, Florida. Yeah, Jerry and I are we're on the same page basically. Well, I'm very happy for you. Uh, I've got Kentucky one. Arkansas two, Tennessee three, Bama four. My top 101 teams list is publishing today. I think it's, it might even go up in the process of us doing our, this podcast here live, uh, live over the internet, which hopefully will be more reliable moving forward. Anyone listening on the audio version, uh, the the YouTube version had a quick little glitch, but you didn't hear that part. Um, here's where I have. I think I think SEC is a four team race. I've got Kentucky second overall in the country. Got Arkansas fifth. I think I have Arkansas rated higher than anyone else in the country. Tennessee 10 and then Alabama seven, uh, 17, excuse me. Um, I do think Alabama could conceivably win the league. I think that's the I think that's the one team that I have lowest that could win it. I have Auburn 29, AM 31, Florida 34. We'll get to those teams in a bit, but I do think there's a top four here. Kentucky, a comfortable uh, uh, maybe not comfortable favorite. I I, I think Arkansas, because of the amount of talent it has. And the amount of freedom that Musk is going to allow those guys to play with is going to push Kentucky. 
I like Kentucky's roster too much though. So let's, let's, let's focus on, on those two teams real quick. Kentucky obviously brings back player of the year, Oscar Shibway. It's the preseason number one team at Ken Palm trivia time. Mm. Yeah. We're going to do a real trivia time here. Okay. Okay. Ralph Sampson. Ken Palm preseason rankings date back to 2009, the year 2009. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. I wish that would have been the trivia time. No, you don't. Anything before that, he didn't do preseason rankings. I checked in and asked him. What school has the most preseason number one rankings in Ken Palm history? So 2009 to 2022. Gonzaga. That is incorrect. Well, it shouldn't be. Gonzaga has two the two years prior to this one. Yep. Care to venture another guess? Of course I do. Okay. Duke. Ding, ding, ding. That's a victory. Eh, is it though? You got it wrong in the first try. Eh, you maybe, you know what? I'll declare you a victory there. That was a victory. Three, three guesses. I would have declared it a victory. Duke was the first preseason Ken Palm number one in 09, then did it in back to back to back years in, in 13, 14, and 15. Kentucky getting preseason number one this season marks the third time Kentucky has actually earned it. It also had it in 2010 and 2011. You'll recall the 2011 team was the 2011 2012 team was the preseason number one team in Ken Palm. It also won the national championship. Kentucky fans are hoping that can repeat itself uh, in regard to that. Other teams that have done it, Michigan State. Four years ago, Kansas has one in there. Villanova and Louisville also have one in there. Kentucky will have Shibway ideally for the first week of the season. We, you know, we're still waiting on that. Oh, by the way, you know, he did undergo quote unquote minor knee surgery recently to clean up something. It has not been confirmed that Oscar Shibway will be available when Kentucky starts its season. So I don't expect this to be a significant factor. At least I damn well hope it isn't. I mean, he's one of the most marketable, notable, interesting, powerful, undeniable players in the entire sport. I would like for him to be ready to go on opening night when Kentucky's going to open against Howard. But if for whatever reason they want to ease him back in after this minor procedure and have him not play against Howard on November 7th and then Duquesne on November 11th, then you obviously have Champions Classic on Tuesday, November 15th, eight days into the season. I would love to believe that at the latest that's when he's coming back. But Cal has played it a little bit coy with Shibway's health. Beyond that, I, I think that this roster has immense 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 potential there jacob toppin uh he is going to be one of the top five breakout players in the country i would expect this season he's a senior super athletic i think he's going to grow into a tr just a tremendous role and won't necessarily be asked to be the guy because Shibway, you know does so much at both ends of the floor but severe wheeler back as point guard you know, that's a top 100 player in the country, one of the better point guards in the nation. He's a bit small, sure, but he really gets the job done, and he'll be able to play off of two really nice incoming talents. Casey Wallace is the highest-rated freshman. Uh, you figure he'll start at the two. He'll be pretty, pretty good. And then I think Chris Livingston is also going to start. If it's not him, it'll be Damian Collins. And I think that no matter whether it's Livingston or Collins, I think that the player that comes off the bench and is the sixth man, if if – if indeed one of those players really, you know, settles into being a permanent six man and, and Cal's not tweaking the, the starting five every other week could be one of the best, if not the best six men in the country there. So there's a lot to love about this team. And it's why I've got them ahead of the uh, up top in the SEC GP, but also number two in the country. I've got Kentucky fourth in the country behind Gonzaga, North Carolina and Houston. But yes, as the SEC favorite and an obvious legitimate national championship contender. Um, we've talked about Kentucky a lot since the end of last season. Uh, we've done Peacock impressions. Uh, that was a rough way to end things. Um, and it's been, um, you know, a, a rough two-year stretch for, for that program. They backed the worst season in modern history for that program um, with a first-round loss to, to St. Peter's. Um, as I've said multiple times in multiple places. I do not believe John Calipari is coaching for his job. I had to do a coaches on the hot seat list yesterday. I did not put him on it. Um, they owe him too much money. And, and he's also very good, you know, at his job. Um, but but I do believe he's under a lot of pressure. I, I don't think it's job pressure like Brad Brunell is under job pressure or Kevin Keats is under uh, job pressure or Chris Collins might be under job pressure. But I, I do think it's real pressure from his fan base. And I don't think it helps him that Bill Self um, just joined the club of, of multiple national championship 
winners. Because I imagine there are some Kentucky fans who are saying, um, we have better talent than, than Kansas basically every year. We have better talent than everybody nearly every year. Duke being an exception, obviously, sometimes. Um, but we're still sitting here and haven't been to a Final Four since 2015. Um, have only won one national championship in the John Calipari era. To be clear, these things are difficult to win. But when you consistently stack top-rated recruiting classes and you have teams that are on paper good enough to do it and you you know, only do it one time in a span that stretches now more than a decade, while other coaches within that same time frame are doing it multiple times, you had Jay Wright, you had Bill Self, well, then people start to ask some questions. But if I were betting, I would bet that this will be a, a season where John gets um, the, the fan base to the extent that, that some have turned on him, and some have. I, I, don't, you know, I don't think it's the whole fan base, but some have gotten, you know, I, like when the Kentucky football coach can publicly challenge the Kentucky basketball coach and Kentucky fans largely side with the football coach, that means the dynamics have changed there a little bit with the fan base. And I, I think he'll – He'll fix a lot of that this season. I think they're going to be really, really good. And I do think this week has been a good week for John Calipari. You know, if we're going to uh, goof around when he refuses, at least initially, to go to the kennel and and play Gonzaga and 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 make jokes about that, I think it's only fair to 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 shine a light on some really cool things that he does. And the stuff with Michael McGuire, the coal miner, this week has has really been. Excellent. For people who may be unfamiliar, um, John saw a picture um, of a man who, you know, looked like he'd been working in a coal mine all day long. And rather than take a shower and come to the game, um, he decided to, you know, or maybe not decided, maybe he had no choice but to, um, you know, hurry, grab his son and get to the arena in time to, to see Kentucky basketball up close. And John really, he brought a lot of attention to it, expressed his appreciation for it, um, you know, acknowledged that, you know, he, his, his, I think the way he put it is my family's American dream started in a coal mine and subsequently found out who this man was and reached out to him and talked to him, talked to his wife, and has invited them to come to Rupp Arena this season um, to, to, to get a VIP experience. And I can tell you from, you know, from covering John way back when, he lives on another planet now than most people. But he, I genuinely believe this. I, I don't think he's ever truly forgotten where he's come from. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in an airport with him, and I believe his father... Um, you know, handled luggage at the Charlotte airport, um, you know, up until his retirement. I hope I have that right. But very much a blue collar, a blue collar man. Even after his son was a multimillionaire, famous, co you know, college basketball coach and NBA coach. I, I don't believe John's father ever just, you know, stopped working, um, you know, was still doing a very blue collar job, even while John was becoming wealthy and, and famous and and that's sort of um that that's that I, I don't think that's fake i don't think john did that for attention this stuff he did this week with with michael mcguire i, I think he did it because that, that really meant something to him it really registered with him and i you know I, I think it's very easy to roll your eyes at at some of the things these rich and famous people do sometimes but i i i, I that felt genuine to me and it was a it's just a really sweet story if you haven't um, heard about it. Kyle Tucker had a nice story on it um, at, at at the Athletic. Yeah, that Cal tweet uh, that transcended college sports, not just college basketball. Seventeen thousand retweets. They found him, and uh, it'll be a story that continues into the season. Really, really inspiring, uplifting stuff here. Um, we'll move along and, and talk hogs real quick because we did do a summer shoot around episode to Arkansas fans that might be listening to this episode. New to the podcast, if you're unfamiliar, we did uh, you know 20, 25 minute show dedicated specifically to the Razorbacks. Uh, some weeks back, you know, sort of a summer look ahead. So uh, more in-depth eval on them. So we won't be too, too deep on this. But yes, the names to know are clearly Nick Smith, Jordan Walsh, Anthony Black, 
three big time freshmen that are aboard. Arkansas made has made back to back elite eights, and you know lost Jalen Williams to the M, you know to the NBA draft and NBA process, if you will. Uh, they certainly were hoping and wanting him to return. He would have been one of the better bigs in the country. He probably would have registered probably like. I don't know, top 20 ish player in the country if he'd returned, but he didn't. He left. And despite that, I mean, I've got Arkansas fifth in the entire country heading into the season. Uh, Nick Smith Jr. is the CBS Sports preseason freshman of the year. I actually think Anthony Black will be the more valuable and better freshman on this team because he is going to be running the point for the most of the time. That opinion yes, is informed by talking to Musk and the Arkansas staff multiple times throughout this preseason. They expect Smith to be an absolute star, but the reality is Black might just have the best. I think Black could have. He could average 13, eight boards and six and a half rebounds and just is the guy more often late in games than Nick Smith. But maybe Nick Smith will actually be like a top three NBA pick and it's going to be undeniable there. They're going to be a ton of fun. Uh, You know, I don't I am admittedly taking a little bit of a leap or maybe even more than that. Arkansas is a universal preseason top 25 team. Some have them in the top 10. I'm going as high as five. But as my capsule at CBSports.com in the top 101 piece that went up on Thursday says, like, you're not supposed to bring in 11 new players and buy for a national title. Eric Musselman is going to try and prove you can do exactly that. It's just a complete flip and the talent's undeniable there. It will be interesting. Maybe it takes this also might be a team where maybe it's like some of the Cal teams from the past GP. Maybe Arkansas is just like, eh, they're all right for the first six weeks of the season. Maybe we look up in mid-February and they really get it cranking and rolling. That might be the case as well, but I'll buy in based off of recent history under Musselman and just the undeniable strength of this freshman class. You know, Jordan Walsh will probably be one of the best freshman defenders in the nation. In addition to just they've got veteran guys, Devo Davis is back uh, in the backcourt and he'll be an important presence as well. I feel like this is a, a little bit of an about face for you with Arkansas because I, I think when we talked early in the offseason, one of the things I told you is that based on nothing more than Twitter reactions, which, you know, take them for what they're worth, often nothing, um, that, that Arkansas, they, I felt like I had Arkansas very high, um, given that they've lost basically everybody except Devontae Davis. And yet Arkansas fans thought I had them too low. I said that was the, that, that's the, not the only place, but the biggest place where I feel like I might have Arkansas high which was, I believe, sixth in the country. And and Arkansas fans were like, no, you have us too low. I thought I was giving the benefit of the doubt to Eric and that staff based on you know their, their track record. But Arkansas fans were like, no, you're, un- you're underselling us. And I feel like you, I feel like you told me, no, no, I will not have Arkansas that high. I won't, I won't even have Arkansas. Very possible. That's I very- won't have Arkansas in the top 10. Ah! And now you got Arkansas in the top five. You well, part of it also speaks to, like, as I've mentioned on the pod before, you know, it's impossible when you have, you know, these jobs to not, when we talk on the podcast and yes, you try and you know, talk to coaches, also do research, but I, I try as best I can. Like I've looked at it now, but I, I try not to look at the, the Torvik pre like the Torvik preseason rankings go up, I think in like June or July. I try not to look at those. Um, I didn't look at Ken Palms before they went up. You know, I basically finished my list before his went up, but I try not to have any influence. So it's not like, well, I think this team should be 29th. But now that I've seen a bunch of people have them like 13th, I'm going to move. I try and dodge that as much as I can. And so totally possible that, you know, in those first three or four pods after the season ended, or maybe even the second one after the season ended, we talked about Arkansas. and, And in that moment, I was like, no chance in hell like this is not gonna be a top 10 team but i i don't know i came to it organically and i looked at it and yes i also am trying to maybe be a bit bolder with a couple other teams arkansas is one of those tennessee i'm a little bit safer on i think i've got him i've got him 10th overall santiago vescovy is back and he is who i would tab as the dark horse to steal sec player of the year and that's if like if she can't do it again or an injury comes up and arkansas has got too many cooks in the kitchen, if you will, that are kind of pilfering each other's stats. Alabama has the same situation. Vescovy is really, really good. That said, I also think I mentioned Jacob Toppin as a top five breakout player of the year candidate. I think another guy on that short list is Akai Ziegler, the the diminutive point guard for Tennessee, who is going to step out of Kennedy Chandler's shadow. He'll be very, very good. Josiah Jordan James is back, uh, one of the older players in the conference there. 
Uh, so Tennessee at 10 feels just about right to me. They've been very consistent and I would be surprised if the vol like p- teams are going to lose games and a team that's, you know, eight, nine or 10 at one point, if you drop a game, like you might slide to 16, 17, you might look up and like you're 22 in the polls. I, I would be surprised if Tennessee was outside of the AP top 25 for more than one or two weeks of the entire season, I think they're just too strong overall and defensively too good. I think they'll just kind of, you know, they'll, they'll be on the radar for, if not the entire season, almost the entire season. My uh, top three in the SEC are Kentucky, which I have fourth in the top 25 and one, then Arkansas sixth in the top 25 and one and Tennessee ninth in the top 25 and one. So three top 10 teams. I, I like the Vols. I mean, they're returning for the top five scores, you know, everybody except Kennedy. Um, you know, I'm with you on, on Vescovy. He, he could, you know, turn into an all American. He averaged you know, a little more than 13 points per game last season, shot above 40% from three, you know, you take that up to, to 17 points per game, shooting 40% from three, and you're doing it for a legitimate top 10 team. Well, that's that's how you get on um, list for All-America uh, c- consideration. For Tennessee, ultimately, I don't want to say it all comes down to the postseason because you've got to get through the regular season to even get to the NCAA tournament. But you are right, as you noted earlier, um, the one knock on, on Rick Barnes at Tennessee and to some extent Texas as well is that the postseason success doesn't quite line up with the regular season results. Um, you know, Tennessee has been eliminated from the NCAA tournament by, I never know how to exactly say this, higher seated or lower seated because the number is higher, seated. Better, better seated. So worse seated. They've been eliminated by worse seated teams. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in in back to back years, and that's that's not that's the type of thing that if it keeps happening, people keep pointing to it. And you heard it a little bit last season, and then it just goes away because we start talking about other things. But if they get in there as a two seed or a three seed, and you know, lose in the first or second round again, then then you know, it's just a bullet point that becomes part of your your the, the stuff people talk about when they talk about you. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. I, I do think um, Rick needs to either advance deep into the bracket or at the very least overachieve relative to the seed Tennessee gets in the 2023 NCAA tournament. I, I, I think that's important. Bama is an interesting one, and I want your thoughts on the tide here because Javon Quinley tore his ACL in the NCAA tournament. He's on his way back, and I think the hope here is that he is effective by Christmas for sure. But, you know, he's going to, if fully healthy, he's probably the second best player on the roster to Brandon Miller. But Alabama has a lot of really good players. I I don't think they'll be as good as the bubble tournament team that went to a two seed and got knocked out by UCLA. I think they could be close though. Like Noah Clowney is going to be a really, really good freshman alongside Brandon Miller. And Brandon Miller, you know, there's so much good freshman talent in the conference. Let me say this, not predicting to be the case. Brandon Miller, could wind up as best freshman in, in the SEC. And that is, a, and I'm, we just talked about who we talked about. It's not inconceivable. He is regarded as a top 15 prospect coming into the class. And with the way that Nate Oates may need to rely on him, you know, just, just keep it in mind. Now I want to see Charles Bediaco is another, you know, really good talent that I think has a big time step up season. But, you know, Namari Burnett is a name that's forgotten about. He was a Texas Tech transfer, sat out all last season with an injury. He's back. And then you get Mark Sears from Ohio, who I don't think he'll be like a top three player of import on this team, but he's going to probably be asked to run the point, and we'll see if he can make the jump up from the MAC. I do think Alabama can win the SEC. I'm not saying I'm predicting it. I'm saying it's the fourth team I would put in consideration. And I I get the sense Nados is quietly confident about his team's capacity to really disrupt in that conference and make a push if you know if they win the sec they'll definitely be a two seat at worst but if not that like you know landing on the three line i think is certainly within the realm of possibility see i've got i've got um alabama at sixth in my sec Ooh, um, okay i like it sec rankings uh behind obviously the top three kentucky arkansas tennessee but then auburn and texas a&m auburn like i know they lose jabari smith but 
and I know that the guards are flawed. I got it. No, I want sell me on it because I've got Auburn tail end of the of the twenties. Just 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 sell me on why you might be more because I'm genuinely interested. Why why well, are you higher on that? Okay, well I've got Auburn. I mean I don't know the word dramatically different on Auburn. You know I've got them fourth in the SEC, fourteenth uh, in the country, and I know they lose Jabari, and I know they lose Walker Kessler, and I know the guards are flawed. But, like, can this be true? Can both these things be true? When you're talking about Katie Johnson, Wendell Green, Allen Flanagan, the guards are flawed, but they're good. They're good. They're, fla- yeah. they're flawed, but good. Like, that, that's a quality. I mean, you know, if we're ranking, uh, you know, backcourts, I'd still take, you know, the returning Baylor guards plus Keontae George. But but Auburn's backcourt would be on that list somewhere of best backcourts in the country. I mean, they, they are experienced guys who have won an SEC title. Like they're not the reasons Auburn won an SEC title, but they were they played a role. They're not the biggest reasons, but they played a role in that happening. So they're flawed. And I think sometimes people say flawed is bad. They're flawed, which means they're not perfect. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to fix some things with them, but they're still quality division one power conference guards and then it just comes down to you know can can what johnny broom did at a lower level of college basketball translate to any notable degree at the power conference level i think people are optimistic that it will i think he's going to be good and then they also enroll a five-star freshman in johan treori um uh you know listen you're not going to replace jabari smith and walker kessler but i think Bruce and his staff did about as well as you could do reasonably expect to do in trying to replace those guys. And this is going to be a team that I, I, I'm not predicting them to win the SEC. But if you told me, you know, we look up in March and Auburn is back to back SEC champions. It's not the craziest thing in the world to me. Yeah. The Smith and Kessler departures, I think will be major to be clear. I have Auburn five in the SEC. GB's got them four. We don't disagree all that much there. You've got Mississippi State, or excuse me, Texas A and M. Similar colors there. I tripped myself up. A uh, and M uh, is A and M twenty. Is, are they in your top twenty-five and one? Yes, I've got A and M nineteenth in the top twenty-five and one, fifth in the SEC, and I'm higher on them than most. They're not in the preseason AP poll. I think they're the first team out. Um, they're they're not in the top twenty-five or top even thirty at 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 Ken Palm, they in fact are um, 45th at Ken Palm, ninth in the SEC. So if you're trying to find a place where I am different than the computers, different from the AP voters, um, or most different from the computers and most different from the AP voters, it would be with Texas A&M. I- I'm a believer. You know, they bring back every relevant player besides Quentin Jackson and Hassan Diara from a team that just barely missed the NCAA tournament. They went to the title game of the NIT. Um, you know, Buzz Williams guided Marquette to the NCAA tournament in year four, guided Virginia Tech to the NCAA tournament in year four. And I think that pattern continues. I think he'll have the Aggies in the NCAA tournament in year four at Texas A&M. Tyrese Radford uh, should be the best player there. Yeah. And uh, keep an eye. Julius Marble from Michigan State. Dexter Dennis from Wichita State are there. Uh, I'm in. 31 overall for Texas A&M for me. And the last team that's involved is Florida, which I think definitely has the roster to get to the NCAA tournament. Now, Todd Golden, year one. This is, there are, you know, four or five coaches from a national perspective that are stepping into new spots that are just going to command a lot of intrigue because we haven't seen them do it. We haven't seen John Shire run Duke. We haven't seen Kyle Neptune run a power conference program. We haven't seen Todd Golden run a power conference program. And he's got Colin Castleton, who I also would put, if not Vescovy, maybe Castleton steals player of the year because I, he, he's going to have numbers. And if Florida's really good, he'll have a chance. Bingo. He is. I, it would be stunning to me. Let me see what Castleton averaged last year real quick here. Cause I, I think th- I listed him as a third team preseason all American. I, I considered him, and in our person, uh, we're gonna release our top 101 players here pretty soon. In my personal 100 list, I think I had uh, Castleton like 20th overall last year, and that's in the country. Uh, last year, he averaged 16.2 points, nine rebounds, 2.2 blocks. Mark me down for Castleton. He's gonna have good talent around him, so I, I don't think he'll get to 20 a game. But mark me down for 18 points, 10 and a half boards, and still north of two two blocks. Um, Really, really good 
coachable talent, great teammate. And then you bring in like, we'll just see what the transfers are. Like Kyle Lofton, St. Bonaventure, considered a top five guard in the portal. Will Richard Belmont, considered one of the better mid-major transfers in the portal. Trey Bonham at VMI, a really good score. They're all taking a jump up. You know, they got Myron Jones, who's my pick. Like, Myron Jones transferred from Penn State. I think he's actually going to be a more important guy than even Florida fans realize right now. And he might be the ingredient that just gets him past the finish line. I will also say this on Florida, because I do find him super intriguing. I think the Gators' variance is pretty significant. If you told me this team was as good as like a five. I think a five seed feels like their ceiling. I, I believe it. Anything higher than that, then Golden's just done a ridiculous job in year one. Five seed ceiling. But I, if you told me that like in this SEC, they were as low as 10th mm, overall and you know maybe scratching to maybe make the NIT, I'd believe it only because of how many different pieces are involved here. But it's hard for me to shake off like – just how good the talent is. And I do think, and this is based off of, you know, I talked to Golden, obviously, to the story. I shouted him over the summer. And what a team does and looks like in practice in July is not what the situation will be in mid-January. But I, they, they feel nine deep minimum and nine deep in a good way. Not like nine deep in terms of like, no, we're going to use these pieces in ways that we need to use them and we'll use them to our advantage. And because of that, I've got Florida 34th overall. I I tried to split the difference here, GP, on where to, on where to put them. There are about there are always like four to eight teams for me when I get into that like 20 to 40 range where I'm trying to figure out like which direction should I really be floating there. And I and I split the difference with the Gators, who I think will be the last team in the tournament from the SEC. Yeah, me too. I've got Florida seventh, and I've got the SEC as a seven team, uh, a seven bid league. You know, Todd's obviously good. You know, he he what he did at San Francisco was super impressive. That's how you that's how you get offered a job like Florida. And I think the biggest question with guys like him when they're obviously good. But they are moving up a level within the sport is like, will they have the rosters good enough to be good? Like, OK, you know, are they going to be able? All right. We know he can win in the West Coast Conference with West Coast Conference caliber players. Can he get SEC caliber players to win in the SEC? Because I heard somebody talking about this yesterday. It's totally true in football, and it's becoming true in basketball. You're not just out scheming people in this league. The talent is overwhelming. Like in football, if you want to compete with the Alabamas and the Georgias, you ain't just going to out-coach people. You, you got to out-recruit them, and then you got to out-coach them. But if you don't out-recruit them, you cannot out-coach them. And that's becoming true in, in college basketball and the SEC as well. You mentioned the freshman talent coming in. I mean, it's like they have more five-star freshmen than any other league in the country. And I don't, I'm not sure it's particularly close. Right. And I say all that to say this. You look at Todd's first roster at Florida, and I think it's good enough. Like how often is, is good, like legitimately good. This is coming from, you know, I'm the former – I was the MC of Atlantic 10 media day pre pan pre pandemic <laughs> pre pandemic. No, no, no MC duties this year though. Yeah. The pandemic screwed up a lot of stuff yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah, not go. the least of which is my Atlantic 10 media day. MC. I gotta, gotta believe you're not totally broken up about that though. Oh no, no, no. I'll, I, I like doing it because I like saying that I did it. All right. That's, I like that. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. Okay. Yeah. I like being able to describe myself as the MC of, of Atlantic 10 media day pre pandemic. Okay. It's just, you know, the pandemic really threw a monkey wrench into a lot of stuff in this country. You know, feels like that's what happened. Including, including my MC responsibility. When we look back at the COVID-19 pandemic, do you think history books will properly acknowledge? Not a chance in hell. That one of the, Biggest losses won't happen of the pandemic was my responsibilities as MC at Atlantic 10 media day Barclays center. I got to say, I'm a no on that one. I would, I would go, I would MC Atlantic 10 media day. And then I'd walk across to that little old Navy just to get me in. I don't know. Just cause it's just right there. You know, you know, what else is right there. Target. No. Nah. Guitar. Guitar. There's a guitar center right there. You know what? You know what's also right there? A Chick fil A and a Shake Shack, like right next to each other. Yeah. It's the best fast food combo in the world, probably. Like when you get a Shake Shack 
and a Chick-fil-A right next to each other. Sounds like a, it sounds like I might need an unprompted tweet right about now. That's a real blessing. Do you go Chick-fil-A or Shake Shack? I think right, I go, go. I think I think I go Shake Shack only because there's Chick-fil-A's everywhere where I live. Um, there are very there are, Connecticut actually has some. I think this is true. I, I, first of all, pescatarian, so don't eat chicken. Uh, this is insane. Ridiculous Norlander fact that is n- nonetheless true. Chicken would be like bottom five food for me in history. I that's insane. I hate chicken. Chicken I is so it. good. I my parents. I, I would sit nine years old at the dinner table, chewing the chicken. And then literally pulling a Seinfeld with the mutton and putting it into my napkin and putting it into my shorts. Have you ever had a spicy Chick-fil-A sandwich? Not a chance in hell. I don't think I've had. I've Now, I've eaten Chick-fil-A food. Uh, actually, coincidentally enough, when I did the shadowing of Golden this summer before you know, they were darting back to get back on the private plane to go from one place to another. Um, the this is the life of a head made of a major head. The pilots of the plane. One of their jobs was to go to Chick-fil-A to make sure Golden and his assistant had like food ready for them when they got back on. It's not the worst life in the world. And so they asked what I wanted. And I was like, bring up the menu. What the hell can I eat? So I did eat like fries and whatever. So but I think I haven't had Chick-fil-A more than two times in my entire life. That's what I'm getting at here. I love chicken so much that my little guys uh, for Father's Day a few years ago. Uh, my wife took them to an art class and um, and they were going to, you know, paint pictures for me for Father's Day. And the instructor was like, OK, so this is for your dad. You um, you should like, what does your dad love? What does your dad care about? What 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 makes your dad happy? That's what you should draw. So my my middle guy, Oliver, he uh, he drew me a basketball. You know, it was a basketball picture and like, you know, it was a big basketball. And he painted it and whatever. And uh, so they, they're, they're giving me these pictures. And I say, uh, so, so how'd you decide what to draw? And they tell me, yeah, the instructor said we should pick something that you love and, you know, really think about it. And so I decided to draw you a basketball because I know you love basketball, Dad. And I said, uh, well, that's really sweet. Thank you. And then Lou, a little guy, he handed me his picture and it was a chicken. And I said, Lou, this is real. This is excellent. Why did you why did you paint me a chicken, though? He said, because I know how much you love chicken. My kids think the two things I love more than anything else in the world are basketball and chicken. And they might be right. Are you a chicken? <laughs> a bang. First of all, the poll, the question's up. I'll update at the end of the podcast. Two, yeah, for this- me, for me, it's Shake Shack. Not because Shake Shack's better than Chick-fil-A, but because I can get Chick-fil-A any day I want, and there are no Shake Shacks in that's not the answer. The answer is like you can only eat one for the rest of your life, then you're making your choice. That's your answer. So is it Chick-fil-A in that scenario? Or have you had so much Chick-fil-A in your life that you're like, yeah, I'm good. And I'll just go Shake Shack from here on out. I think I'd go Shake Shack because at Shake Shack, you can get cheeseburgers or they have a really nice chicken sandwich themselves at Shake Shack. Whereas at Chick-fil-A, you're just really getting chicken. I, I obviously go Shake Shack here. That's, uh, that's we have like- friends. We have friends who own Chick-fil-A's. So when I, if so, if I want Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, not really a problem. I can get it. Are you breaking news right now? I mean, I'm not bragging. Play like access on a Sunday? It might sound like I'm bragging. You're not Maybe the I'm... only. You're not the only member of the CBS community that can do this. By the way, our own Maybe. David Cobb, his wife works for Chick Fil A, I believe, and is like, she's a Chick Fil A influencer. I think that's what we what what you know. She's my, making. My, Maybe you misunderstood what I said. My friends own Chick Fil A's. Okay. <laughs> Franchises. They own franchises. They're breaking in on a Sunday, tossing on the fryer. I can get a Chick Fil A tray whenever I want, whenever I want. All right, there we go. And yet, and yet, you betray those close to you and pick a Shake Shack. If you want, the poll will be up for twenty four hours. This is an SEC pre. You know what, Chick Fil A SEC preview pod. I actually think that makes a ton of sense. That we were talking about Kyle Lofton in Florida. <laughs> now talking- officially, by far, our longest conference preview. And I do want to do what we've done in every single other one and legitimately give a, a mention of every single other team. Let's just stroll through the bottom half. Of this yeah, year. you you go ahead. I'm gonna daydream about. Okay. Here we go. I'm just going to Ole Miss is next. I, I got Ole Miss next. I got him 55 overall in the country there. Uh, Matthew Morell is the name to know. He averaged like, you know, 
north of 15 points in the final month last season. I think he is the dark horse to be like a first team all SEC guy. He will be the MVP of this of this group. Why doesn't Ole Miss do a promo? Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. Maybe they will. How do you know that's not the case? I'm just yeah. it's a free idea for you folks down in Oxford. Mr. Morrell yeah. and the Big Steppers. Just keep an eye on Ole Miss because if they don't dance, you know, I'm not saying Kermit Davis deserves it. I just, it feels maybe hot seedy. You know, we'll see how it goes. If they're competitive in the SEC. Like they were Kermit's bad. They were bad last year, but they were hurt last year. Top two scores barely played. I know. Just, you know, I got a middle of the league. If they're there, yeah, you know, maybe Kermit survives. Uh, if they're bot, if they're bad, like bottom four in the league, and then they're going to, there's going to be another coaching change there. Then let's get to a lot of these schools with new, faces in new places i got lsu 62 overall and a lot of that is due to kj williams coming from murray state who like was a power conference player thriving at the at the mid-major level uh, there's a couple of murray state guys that came over mcmahon built out a good staff there i'm a little ambitious on him but a lot of this was also tied to yeah you know <sighs> sec will be top heavy but there's going to be some teams that break into this like when we look at the net Torvik, Evan Maya, Ken Palm, Sagarin. We're going to see a few of these teams in the top 70 of those rankings, even if they're not competing for at large bids. So I put LSU in that company overall. And then I've got it from an sec standpoint in my overall rankings. I, then I've got a significant gap there. The next highest team after LSU in the high sixties, you scroll all the way down to get to South Carolina at 87. Frank Martin's out Lamont Paris, who just took Chattanooga to the tournament. He's in, Gigi Jackson is the is the big, you know, big player there. He was the number one player in the class of 23. He reclassified, was number six in 22. I let's not put too much on his his shoulders here. Carolina is not going to be an NCAA tournament team or anything like that. But I am interested to see what he does there. Yeah, Gigi Jackson at South Carolina feels a little bit like Anthony Edwards at Georgia. Yes, and he won't be and he won't be as good. As no, Jordan. he will not be. Yeah, I agree. With, but I agree that's with. A, that's actually I hadn't considered that GP. Uh, bingo, bingo from you right there. Then I'm speaking of Georgia, got Georgia 93rd overall and Georgia I th is by most is seen as bottom two team in the sec. I'm just, I went off of Mike white on this. Okay. Because yeah, the team was six and 26 last season, final year under Tom Crean, but Mike white has won 66% of his games in his career. And that was at Louisiana tech. And then at Florida combined, you know, they're not going to be an NIT team, but I, I'm going to say that he, you know, he, he does all right for himself here in the first year. I've got them narrowly ahead of Mississippi State, who's 97 overall. Chris Jans, and I even admit in the story, uh, I could slip up on that one. Like, I've got Mississippi State 97. Maybe Jans immediately does damage, makes moves, has has the Bulldogs, you know, kind of a listless, directionless program trying to push its way into the NIT. Maybe they're a top 65 team. I could whiz on that. I got them 97. Yeah. And then the only two teams I didn't have ranked in my top 101 – were Vandy and and Missouri. Yeah, we'll see. I wanted to, frankly, I wanted to make room for a few mid-major teams that project as like clear-cut champions in the conference. Like I think Iona will be better than Missouri this year. So I have Iona ranked and I don't have Missouri ranked. Now Missouri's 41. It came on. 41. That's notable. It's it's notable. I noticed that myself. That's like, that's, a, that's if you're 41 at Ken Palm, you are in at-large contention. If you're 41st at Ken Palm on March 1st, you are in at-large bid contention. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if they'll be able to live up to those expectations, but the computer number next to Missouri's name is something that I noticed. 47 at, uh, at, at, at Torvik, 41 slow but speeding for, uh, for your Mizzou Tigers there at Ken Palm. Isaiah Mosley is the big transfer from Missouri State, you know, Top five, top three score of anyone in the transfer portal there. So we'll see how he handles the jump up. Kobe Brown returning is is significant as well. Dennis Gates is the new is the new coach there. And then you know uh, Vanderbilt just hasn't yet gotten there. You know uh, under under Stackhouse, maybe it does. Jordan Wright is a big time returner. They lose Scotty Pippen Jr. Uh, someone's got to finish thirteen. Someone's got to finish fourteen in the SEC. So that's an overall scan. We agree. Seven in, and, and, and I don't know it's gonna be a it's gonna be a pretty uh, a pretty fun, pretty entertaining league. Uh, there will be a surprise, at least one. I'm interested to see who it will be. Let's get to our predictions on player, coach, and freshman of the year. Who you got? 
Well, first, you, you said you didn't have two SEC teams in the top 100, in your top 100. Um, SEC's got 10 teams in the top 50 at Ken Palm. All 14 are in the top 100. It, it projects as the second best league in the country behind only uh, the Big 12, for whatever that's worth. Uh, player of the year, I mean, there's only one sensible that's option, and that's Oscar Shibway at Kentucky. And honestly, I thought there was only one sensible option for national player of the year. But then the ballots were turned in by uh, a panel of CBS Sports analyst and Drew Timmy. It's true. Is the preseason national player of the year. So before I uh, expand, why don't you explain for the Kentucky fans listening Mm -hmm. why the national player of the year returned to college and you decided somebody else should be the preseason national player of the year. As uh, as I explained to you in Slack, and then as you put into our preseason player of the year, freshman of the year post at CBS Sports late last week, uh, it's equally part sensible to not predict a player will win national player of the year in back to back seasons because we haven't seen it in four decades in this sport. And when you look Oscar at Shibway has not come back in four decades in this sport, I would. Also but many say. other national player of the years have, and they failed to do it. It's so disrespectful. To when me. you consider that another first team All American for a perennial one seated program, who we know will be as statistically outstanding due to the team he's on and the league he plays in, is back and Drew Timmy. That's why I picked Drew Timmy. And and and, and though and if 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 I needed to break the tie. Uh, one of these players just had surgery. The other one didn't. And one is a go for opening night and the other one isn't. So give me true Timmy. One has a great mustache. The other one doesn't. True. Right. It's true. And, true. And, like, and I do think like when you consider uh, Timmy's got dudes around him, Zach's got dudes all day. We know that, but you know, uh, how much, uh, how much will case and Wallace put up a game severe Wheeler in a big year again, Jacob Toppin, I think will be outstanding. Uh, just, I just wonder if, if, Sheboy's stats if they get muted uh, let me be clear about this Sheboy last year I interviewed him about this and wrote about it like mid-December he was he was like he he was tremendous I think I got him after a practice and then like he's talking to me while he's taking an uber back to where he lives and he was just like joking with the driver it was an awesome like 15 minute interview I loved it but he was dedicated to trying to finish the season averaging 20 rebounds a game which obviously is like outrageous it hasn't been done um in like 60, 70 years or whatever. Uh, but he averaged 15.1 last year. I would love to see Sheboy actually. Can he get to 17, 17 and a half, 18 a game? It would be ridiculous. Uh, so I'd love to see that. And I do think he's capable. If he does that and the, po- and the points stay static and Kentucky's in contention for a top line, then yeah, he's going to win it again. But I, I, I played the historical odds and I went with Timmy. Player of the year, Oscar Sheboy. SEC freshman of the year, Nick Smith at Arkansas. And... SEC Coach of the Year. Mm. It's tough. It is. I, I'll go John Calipari just because I think Kentucky is going to be really good. And I'm not going to – I never hold it against coaches for being what they're supposed to be. I hate – I hate the way people vote I, on Coach I, of the I, Year I, awards. I like it's like if you're supposed to be good, you are eliminated from contention according to some. Which, which totally disregards the fact that the overwhelming majority of a coach's job is to uh, assemble a roster that gives you a realistic chance to be great. And, and yet when you do that, we say, ah, oh, well, you can't be coach of the year now because you're supposed to be too good. That's silly to me. So I'll go John Calipari, coach of the year. But if, um, you know, Dennis Gates or Todd Golden were able to get at large bids in the first year at their schools, I could see them making a run at it. And then of course, you know, if Arkansas were to win the sec, I mean, must loses every, basically everybody, nearly everybody from a, from a elite eight team and then wins a regular season title. Like it's not, tell me how the, I guess this goes, I guess this goes for literally every league in the country. You're, you're, you're really working through this right now. Tell me how the, how the seasons tell me how these things the standings are going to look at the end of the year and I'll, and then I can name your coach of the year no problem but 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 based on where we're at, at hand you are <laughs> predicting player of the year Oscar Shibley freshman of the year Nick Smith coach of the year will be John Calipari okay obviously I have Oscar 
Um, if you make me pick number two, I'll say Castleson at Florida freshman of the year. I'm going to say Anthony black ball in his hands, running the point better overall stat line. I'll go Anthony black at Arkansas coach of the year. I will say John Calipari, but I think Muss. I mean, if Muss finishes second in this league with this roster, it's like a two or three seed. He could take it. And then yes, uh, since Florida's projected to be like in the postseason conversation, if Florida doesn't finish top three, I don't see golden. But if any other new coach gets their team into the NCAA tournament in the first season, they will also be a risk to John Calipari winning coach of the year in the SEC. Those are all of our league previews. Couple couple housekeeping notes here. Mm-hmm. First of all, let's see the feedback real quick on this fast food stuff here. Um, we got Chick-fil-A winning 72 to 28 percent, but we're early. Mm -hmm. Uh, we got a Shake Shack is extremely overrated and overpriced. Um, Shake Shack is not fast food. Someone has a Culver's mention. What are we talking about? Shake Shack's not fast food. I don't know. Got a hard pass on anything Chick-fil-A from Fire Dwarf TJ. Um, (laughs) Fire Dwarf? Shouts to Fire Dwarf. Uh, someone says, get this bland-ass chicken TF out of here. All right. Um, What's people so mad about? Why is everybody mad? Listen, people get fired up over their fast food. Chick Fil A winning in a runaway. Nada, you want? I, I think not as. What is, is even not- over? Shake Shack's overpriced. Like it's fast food. What are we talking about? It's just like, what do you what, like? Nada, I, I think you're heavy on the on the Chick Fil A bandwagon here. You want you want a quick minute here? I uh, if this was Chick Fil A versus Culver's, I would have done Culver's. I think Shake Shack is incredibly overrated. That's that's ninety percent of my problem. I feel Shake like Shake really Shack good. is properly rated. The annoying thing about Shake Shack is how many times you ever walk into a Shake Shack and it's not minimum eight minute wait to get to order your food. It takes a minute. It does take a minute. That's the problem. Actually, I've, I've gotten it. I've gotten it pretty pretty fast. Actually, I don't think I ever have. And that that is that is but, but for crazy me, it, many it, times from even walking into a spot where I look and I'm like, man, there's like seventeen people in line right now. I'm not doing that. Yeah, well, like that's the, the to the extent that it takes a minute to get your food. For me, it's always been because there's a million other people in the place. I ain't never seen an empty Shake Shack my whole life, sir. You seen- live you live in Memphis. When's the last time you've seen an empty Chick Fil A? Yeah, but Chick Fil A man, they get you moving through there. Are, are you kidding me? He's walking into the joint on a Sunday. You can, yeah, like I did. Bringing his case of vodka and walking in Chick Fil A's on Sundays at one thirty in the afternoon. Yeah, I call it Chick Fil A. They can get you through there. Uh, that drive through, like if you see a Popeye's drive through with eight cars in it, you better just keep it moving. You'd get in that thing, you'll still be there tomorrow. But if you see a Chick fil A drive through with eight cars in it, man, you'll be in there in two minutes. No problem. I had, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this. I, we have friends who own franchises. Gosh. And I asked him one time at dinner, I was picking his brain a little bit. I said, uh, All right, level with me. How are you guys so good at the drive through? You know what he said? He said, We care. That's all it takes. You just have to care. I thought that was interesting. The key to having a successful drive through that moves efficiently is just caring about it a little bit. Not enough people care about it. I ain't naming names, but Drop not enough people Shake care Shack. about it. Drop your Shake Shack versus Chick-fil-A stories in the Apple Pod reviews, by the way. If you want to you want to mix it up, by all means, we will have one more preview episode for you. It will be the best of the rest. It will be early next week. We want to touch on the, the the teams to know outside the power conferences there. And yeah, we are we are you know basically a week and a half out from the start of the season. We're almost there. If you are interested in my top 101 teams and GP's top 25 and one, we'll make sure Nada links both of those in the episode description for this particular episode. So um, thanks again. That's all I got. GP, take it away. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Hawk and Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify to Apple. Leave a nice review about Shake Shack, Chick-fil-A, premarital sex, whatever you want. There's more of us than there are of them. I think Chick-fil-A might be a them. You're damn right. That's a, pro- <laughs> that's a problem. I feel like Shake Shack's a us. I feel like Shake Shack gets down, but Chick-fil-A might be a them. Uh, Something to consider. Something to consider. Five stars. Nice review. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, knock that out. We're going to talk to you again real soon. Deadleg told you when. Till then, take care.